Well, welcome back to First Samuel. We're in chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, and we are looking at Hannah's song of exaltation. I've entitled it, From Troubled in Spirit to Triumph in God. Hannah's song of exaltation. Well, in the first couple of verses, she's exalting God. She exalts God's salvation. She exalts God's otherness. No other God is holy like Hannah's God. No other God is omnipotent like Hannah's God. But there's a warning in verse 3 against exalting self. So the right way to exalt God does not include exalting self. And it's following the pattern in verses 2 verses 4 through 8 of exalting the humble and abasing the proud. In verse 9 and 10, we're reminded that God's sovereign control over all the earth is good reason for not exalting self as well and for relying on God's exalting. What was the setting for Hannah's song in chapter 2 verse 1 through 10? Well, we know it begins with a silent prayer in the first chapter from a woman troubled in spirit, Hannah says to the priest Eli. Other translations would say that a woman who was very unhappy, who, was, who felt miserable or heartbroken. And the reason given is because of the irritation, the provocation she got from Penaniah, her rival wife who had many children but she because the lord closed her womb had none then we find in chapter two a public thanks to god who exalts the faithful hannah witnesses to this at the end of chapter one for this child i prayed and the lord has granted me my petition that i made to him for samuel 127 and it follows the example of exaltations by Moses, the men of Israel in Exodus 15, Miriam and the women in Exodus 15, Moses and Israel, Deuteronomy 32, and Deborah and Barak in Judge 5. So giving public thanks to God who exalts those who are faithful is a prominent theme in the first part of the Old Testament. Well, let's read the first three verses. Rejoicing in the Lord who saves. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So she exalts in her God. She prayed. This is called a, a song because of the uh, kind of literature it is. It reads like a poem or like a song. But it's not a prayer of supplication. It's not a request. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. Yet not simply a thanksgiving for the birth of a son. In fact, the subject of the barrenness and birth giving is mentioned only in verse 5. It really is a song of praise or a hymn to God who reverses human fortunes by his mighty power. Well, the word to exalt or rejoice, these tell us that the real source for her joy is not her personal gain, that of a baby, but rather God himself. Hannah views her own deliverance as something that both exalts the Lord and enables her to exult in God for his grace as a response to her enemies. Many people compare Mary's song of praise in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and following to Hannah's own song, and there are many echoes. For instance, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, in Luke 1, 46 and 47. She continues to exalt her God and the Lord. She mentions it twice. But her experience is a response to God's intervention, to his acts, and the Lord twice in your deliverance. It's all about what God does. More specifically, it's 
his salvation. Well, personal experiences of God's deliverance and favor also elicit praise in the Psalms and Daniel and Romans, even the healed paralytic in Luke 5 and Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, the response at Nain in Luke 7, and of course Jesus himself in Matthew eleven twenty five. So it's good to praise God for his salvation. So what changed between that first silent, anguished prayer and this prayer of rejoicing, of exaltation? Well, it begins with, because I rejoice. The cause of her boasting was what God had done, salvation. He had delivered. The Lord and his salvation are cited most frequently as the reason for joy in the Old Testament. And so it is here. Bergen adds, the Lord, the object of Hannah's delight is neither herself, that she has overcome the disgrace of barrenness, nor her son. Instead, it is the Lord who is the source of both her son and her happy circumstance. This kind of joy and exultation is with her whole person. Notice her heart's involved. His heart is full of joy. Her horn or her vitality or strength in verse 1 and verse 10, which frames this song, speaks of God giving strength to those who have no strength in themselves. And God giving sons or exults gives power, honor to a prophet in First Chronicles 25 verse 5. In fact, in that case, the prophet had 14 sons along with some females, but it is an honor. Perhaps she is referencing that here. But I think it's larger than that. Also includes mouth. Literally, my mouth is enlarged. It boasts, it gloats, it derides. Against who? Against God's enemies. His enemies are Hannah's enemies too. Of course, Psalm 139 speaks of this. Because his enemies attack her trust in God and his dealings with her. So we see in this prayer, there's something much more than just thanksgiving for the birth of a son after a long period of barrenness and much provocation. She identifies with God's bigger picture of things. One author says this, her heart, strength, and mouth, all that she thinks and does and says is centered in the great act of God on her behalf. Well, there are some reasons to rejoice in the Lord. First of all, for his holiness, verse 2. God is above the weaknesses and imperfections of mortals and thus can accomplish the deliverance of his people, Exodus 15. <coughs> because God is holy by nature and separate from moral imperfection, he can be trusted to be faithful to his promises. <coughs> In comparability, there is none is listed three times. Well, Hebrew prayers were monotheistic. They were praying to only one God who was a true God. There was no other God or tier of gods that could frustrate God's will. But on the other hand, pagan prayers were polytheistic. There were many gods. <coughs> and depending on what you needed, you prayed to a particular God. And of course, you probably had to sacrifice and do some other things to catch his ear or his attention. Well, the Bible explains, gives examples of prayer that portray Yahweh as a God who listens, not a deity who is distant or must be cajoled into attending the affairs of humanity. What other God is like our God? <coughs> One more term is mentioned, rock. It's a stronghold, a fortress, a refuge in Second Samuel and in the Psalms. Um, so David's song also uses this term, among other terms, here in this particular song at the end of Second Samuel. Well, it was a common name for Syrian and Anatolian deities, so there were other gods that were called a rock. Uh, but uh, Moses in Deuteronomy 32:31 makes the claim that their rock is not as our rock. Our enemies are by themselves. There's no other God that is strong or a refuge like ours. It's not being represented as an idol carved from stone, but that he is totally reliable. He's a rock that can't be moved, can't be defeated. 
Psalm 62 says, the man who relies on God as his rock will not be greatly moved. Amen. <laughs> Verse 3, it seems that Hannah turns to warn others about boasting about themselves. It's not Penaniah. Verse 3, the terms talk and you are plural. So it must refer to the enemies of God. Perhaps Penaniah is a part of that, but the focus is on all of the enemies of God. And they're speaking very proudly. Very, of course, means many, more, numerous. But that term's also used with Hannah, who continued many, numerous, praying before the Lord in chapter 1, verse 12. The term proudly is also translated high, and it's used of Saul in chapter 9, Eliabib, chapter 16, and Goliath, chapter 17. All these were men who were visually more impressive than David. So why is boasting foolish, according to Hannah? Well, God alone is the one that delivers. God alone is transcendent, unequaled, and reliable. There's no comparison with anybody else, especially not with ourselves. And God knows and judges. Literally by him, deeds are measured. And Proverbs 16 puts it this way, all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. He knows so much more about us and why we have nothing to brag about than we do. Well, what about prayer and God's holiness? Well, knowing that God's purpose in your afflictions must be holy, pure, and good, you can be comforted by Hannah's example that the day of God's deliverance will come for you in the manner and time of his own choosing. When it does, you will have every reason to praise him as the holy God that he is. How long did Hannah suffer going to uh, the tabernacle or the tent of meeting uh, with her family and her rival Penaniah and year after year being abused and, and mocked and derided by Penaniah for not having any children? And yet God in, her own, in his own time delivered her another thought what do we boast about well here's what one author says we can be so preoccupied with our problems that we focus simply on our petitions even when our prayers are answered we all too easily move on to the next request on our mental lists we can be like the nine lepers whom jesus healed and who never thought to thank him in luke 17 do we take the time to thank God for all that he does? Jeremiah says this, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the rich, the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. What do we boast about? <clears throat> well, another thought, a boasting of God will be our future job. God has also predestined the church to the praise of God's glorious grace in Ephesians, Matthew, Ephesians again, Philippians, 1 Peter. The future vocation of the redeemed in glory is to sing praise to God and the Lamb. <clears throat> Doxologies are fitting because they capture what God intends for people. Amen. <coughs> well, in verses 2, verses 4 through 8, we have a reversal of fortunes, if you will. There are seven of them. <coughs> and there's a pattern here. Let's read the, the text. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. <coughs> Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren have borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. 
to make them sit with princes and to inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the Lord are the earth, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. Seven reversals. Mighty and weak exchange places, fed and hungry exchange places, barren and fruitful are reversed, death and life are reversed, dying and restored, change places. <coughs> Poor and rich, ignoble and noble also reverse their fortunes. Let's look at the first one, verse four, the mighty and the feeble. The mighty are those who are strong, courageous, even warriors, whose bow is broken, whose strength is shattered. And verse 10, it says that the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. So the idea is that the mighty lose their strength, their ability to fight. <coughs> well, the feeble are those who are stumbling, tottering, or weary, or fatigued, and they bind or <coughs> gird on strength. <coughs> it has a military feel to it. You bind on your sword and so forth. But it's God who equips me with strength, uh, David says in Psalm 18. In Mary's song, it's echoed by verse 52 of chapter 1. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. <clears throat> the next reversal is the full and the hungry. <clears throat> full, satisfied, abounding in. In verse 36, <clears throat> the fool hires himself to another for a morsel of bread. Well, more specifically, it is the, uh, the line of Eli who are judged by God, who are begging for a morsel of bread. Those who were hungry or voracious cease to hunger. In fact, the term refers to being fat or prosperous. <clears throat> the barren has borne seven. It's a number of perfection, and according to Walcott, it signifies as a complete reversal of her barrenness. We know from uh, chapter one, she has her first child, Samuel, after many years. She has a total of six, so seven seems, seems to signify perfection as it does elsewhere in scripture. <clears throat> she who has many is forlorn. She languishes, she's exhausted. It's sometimes used of a widow or one who is barren in Jeremiah 15. It suggests that this person is an object of God's punishment. Again, a reversal of fortune. One who has many children becomes as one who has none. Again, Mary's song. He has filled or satisfied the hunger with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Luke 1, 53. <clears throat> well, another reversal. Life and death in verse 6. The Lord kills and brings to life. It's a mesmerism. It means that God has control of life and death and everything in between. <coughs> he brings down to Sheol. It can be near death or it can refer to the grave as it does in Numbers 16 and elsewhere. David in his song says this, the cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. <clears throat> so near death. And the Lord raises up. He brings down, he raises up. It seems to be a return to the land of the living from one who has suffered a near death experience. And Psalm 86, 13 testifies, thou hast delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Another reversal, social and economic status. <clears throat> the Lord makes poor and makes rich. Well, some who are rich were made poor. Deuteronomy 8 says, Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. I think uh, De Deuteronomy would say baloney. Some who were poor were made rich. They lacked wealth, according to 2 Kings 24. They lacked social status in Amos 2 and now they are made rich. Those whom God made poor were formerly rich. Not simply the poor have always been with 
been poor. He brings low, humbles opposite of exalt. So instead of exalting, he brings low. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. Second Samuel 22, again, David's song. And Mary's song, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble state. <clears throat> oh, more on status. He raises up the poor from the dust. Well, the poor have no economic resources. They're exposed to injustice and oppression. And from the dust, they're insignificant. They cannot get any lower. <clears throat> he lifts the needy. A similar term, but it means poor in material spirit sense. Uh, one author says he may have lost his ancestral land in Exodus 23. He may have reverted to borrowing in Deuteronomy 15. He's the recipient of special gifts on Purim, Esther 9. May not have had any clothing, maybe he lacked food, certainly using the sense of material want. The poor is one who has fallen on hard times. So he lifts the needy. He lifts the needy from ash heaps. Another translation, REB says refuse heap. Uh, still another translation, dunghill. None of these are pleasant. Uh, it's used in a figurative sense of miserable conditions. You can think of Job chapter 2, who took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes and suffered. <clears throat> but Psalm 113, which echoes much of this song as well, gives this promise. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Well, there's a reversal of honor as well. Those who are in the ash heaps, those who are in the dung hills, are going to sit with princes. And of course, to sit among rulers was a considerable privilege and was controlled with a view to the careful dispensation of relative honor and dishonor. Recall some of the parables in the New Testament where seating was considered very important, especially at the head of the table by some of the religious leaders of that day. Well, not only sit with princes, but inherit a seat of honor. It's just not a temporary seat. Uh, it signifies as giving or receiving property, which is part of a permanent possession. It's theirs. They're going to be able to keep it. And the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father in his throne. We, too, get to look forward to honor, a seat of honor. Well, God can raise the humble. <clears throat> John Calvin wrote to his friend William Farrell with a similar idea of God when suffering grief over the death of his wife, I had to let, may the Lord Jesus support me under this heavy affliction, which would certainly have overcome me had not he who raises up the prostrate, strengthens the weak and refreshes the weary, stretched forth his hand from heaven to me. Likewise, when Hannah was downcast, God lifted her head. When she was barren, he brought life to her womb. When she was disgraced, he gave her an honored place. The Lord will do likewise in many ways and at times of his sovereign choosing for all who humble themselves in faith and look to him to be their God and Savior. We need to be humble. Well, why God has the right to exalt and raise up, starting with verse 8. Well, the phrase, the term for, tells us that it's a causal clause. It means because of for or since. There is a reason why God has this right in verse 8. Well, he's the God of the creator who set the foundations or pillars of the earth. Job's reminded of this by God in chapter 38. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its found cornerstone? <clears throat> and the psalmist in Psalm 75, When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars, Silah. Uh, 
Um, so God's in control of everything, and it begins with creation and his control of it. So when everything seems to be falling apart or tottering in our lives, God's in control of even that. Another quote on God's sovereign control over everything. First aid ends with her affirmation that the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he set the world on them. All of this is used to explain what she said in verse 6 through 8a. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of God's honor. Of honor, sorry. God's power in creation demonstrates his social control over all things. Sometimes when we are caught up with what's falling to pieces around us, maybe we should pause and reflect on God's control over everything, including his creation. <clears throat> Last section, God's sovereign control of the future, verse 9 and 10. Let's read. He will guide the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So how does he guard the faithful? Well, it's an image of protection and watchfulness. It's an imperfect tense. It suggests that he habitually protects and watches out for his faithful. <clears throat> So whose feet are in view here? Well, the steps of man are established or made firm by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. Psalm 37. Well, it's the feet of people who belong to the Lord. And feet is a, represents a part of the whole. So we're talking about a whole person here, not just your feet. <clears throat> so who are the faithful? Well, there's two possible meanings here. One is to whom the Lord has pledged his covenant love, his hesed. Well, there's a clue here. Anna means grace, and she rejoiced in God's salvation. So maybe that's in view. But also, one who is, character is, by, is characterized by hesed, or loyalty. And that would be true of Hannah and her yearly visits to the house of the Lord. Some went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord. She, her rival, Penaniah, used to provoke her. 1 Samuel 1, seven. <clears throat> well, he judges the wicked in verse 9 and 10a. The wicked are those who, well, it includes the idea of wickedness, evil intent, injustice against God or persons. It's intentional. And they rely on their own strength to prevail. Uh, that's where the stick figure on the right comes into view. Uh, Goliath, of course, from 1 Samuel 17. Well, David makes this boast to Goliath. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. <clears throat> The wicked are also the adversaries. They not only do injustice against God or persons, but they strive or contend with God. And there may be a, a, a nod to Penaniah because the same term is used of a rival wife in verse 6 of chapter 1 and also Leviticus 18.18. 18. But I think the judgment here is much bigger and the wicked is much larger because it refers to the ends of the earth. So what does it mean he will judge to the ends of the earth? Well, <clears throat> to start with, these adversaries, these wicked will be cut off. That means to be silent. It's a euphemism for death, of course. And it's in darkness. Sheol is often represented as darkness, but it indicates judgment or a curse in Job as well. To be shattered or broken to pieces speaks of extensive or even total devastation. It's a very difficult judgment in view. How? He thunders. 
at least in chapter 10 of first Samuel and or chapter one, two of first Samuel and chapter seven of first Samuel and Psalm 77 and 81 and also second Samuel 22 and David's deliverance from Saul <clears throat> at just the right time. So God thundered against Philistines and routed them and enabled David to escape. <clears throat> Well, judgment is towards those who oppose God. And it includes all the earth. Well, God is the creator, is sovereign over all the earth. He has a right to assess and to judge the world. How will he judge? With his anointed, verse 10. He will give strength to his king. It's the first time that king is mentioned uh, this early in the Bible. Um, as far as Israel is concerned. And first and second Samuel is all about providing his king for Israel to rule on God's behalf or to judge on God's behalf. Um, and God will exalt him. Uh, one author or commentator suggests that this began with the victorious and splendid expansion of the power of David. So God gave him strength. But anointed becomes important here because it is in Hannah's song that the word anointed, uh, the Hebrew for Messiah, is first used in connection with a king. <clears throat> so Christ, the anointed one, was foretold by Samuel, according to Acts 3.24. This is interesting. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. And the question is raised where in Samuel does Samuel foretold the Messiah? Well, I think Kaiser has it right. Or where does he make reference to it? Uh, here in First Samuel chapter two, verse ten, and of course we have uh, the promise of the Lord given to David in Second Samuel chapter seven, but that's beyond Samuel's time. So the Messiah, as the exalted king, will be the judge of all the earth. Well, let's talk about faithfulness for a little bit in view of this period of, of reversal and judgment. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Well, those of us who have been through life for a while realize that uh, we have probably fallen more than seven times and wondered if maybe uh, our warranty is expired. Um, but no, seven is like the seven children mentioned earlier, seems to be a symbol of for completeness. It means that the righteous will always get up. On the other hand, the wicked will fall easily. So we may fall up more than seven times, but we rise up through God's strength. Faithful where we are, we should get on with being faithful to him in the situation in which we find ourselves. It may be that God will use us to achieve great things. It may be that he calls us simply to be faithful. How hard it must have been for Hannah to keep attending uh, services year after year after and have such brokenheartedness. And yet she remained faithful and God was able to bless her. Well, God will bring justice and time. So what do we know about Hannah's song? Well, we know that we should be exalting or praising God by praising God for salvation. We should praise God for he is, his uniqueness, his holiness, his omniscience. And... By not exalting self, I wonder if maybe it's possible sometimes when we share prayer requests and God's answers to prayer, if we sometimes are tempted to exalt ourselves rather than exalt God and what he did. Well, in verse 4 through 8, we should follow God's pattern of exalting the lowly and bringing down the, the mighty, if you will and making sure we remain humble. 
And last but not least, why exalting God is necessary is because of his sovereign control. We have nothing to exalt about in ourselves. And we have amazing blessing of Christ himself. Well, that's the end of this lesson. I hope you'll be around for the next lesson, which should be, Lord willing, another week, and we'll be looking at the rest of chapter 2. God bless.